Okay, I think I can start now. Uh, so, are there any questions from last time? Okay, so let me try to remind you. Basically, the plan of my lectures was that first lecture was quantum mechanics, second lecture was about today is going to be about quantum field theory, quantum fields. Third lecture will be about general relativity and classical black holes. And the fourth lecture is going to be about quantum black holes. As you can see, it's a very steep, uh, uh, I don't know how we will, how much we will succeed, but actually we more or less succeeded in explaining quantum mechanics. Today I will explain what are quantum fields. And the objective is, as, we, as I said, for this book, uh, I want to explain the connections between various aspects of quantum black holes and topics in number theory and geometry in a manner that should be accessible to any mathematician or a student from other areas of physics with a rudimentary knowledge of you know, the basic undergraduate physics that they may have seen. And uh, with that view, we started to develop a dictionary so that we can communicate with each other. So we said that a physical system S with it we associated a Hilbert space. Then we said that the state of the physical system, we associated with it a, a state vector in the Hilbert space. And in fact, as there was already mentioned, physically what is it, it's really a ray because the vector and another vector multiplied by a phase have the same physical consequences. So you can, you have to keep this in mind. So it's really strictly speaking a ray. I will come to that in a second. In this notation, it's only a phase, and the norm can be anything. No, notation does not imply that it's e to the i theta, where theta is real. No, no, no. No, no. So this can be any real number at this stage. No, I don't want that. I don't want that. So I will come to that. Yes. I mean, we will come to that. I, I will mention. I will come to that. Yeah. Yeah, we are jumping ahead. A physical observable. Yeah, I will try to. I mean, there have been some of these confusions, so I will try to address them so that they are not important confusions, but it can stop you from. So we said that these are self adjoint operators. And uh, like A, for example, and the eigenvalues, uh, results of a measurement, correspond to the eigenvalues of the operator. alpha, let's say, alpha i of the operator. So if you perform, if you measure some observable given a state, the result that you will obtain will be one of these eigenvalues of the observable alpha. And the probability for if, and let's say pi is a projector. So this is the measurement axiom which I didn't really explain in detail last time because that was a bit of a uh, diversion from what I wanted to do, but let me state it anyways. If Pi is a projector onto 
the eigen subspace of alpha i. Then the probability given a state psi, the probability of obtaining the result alpha i, if you have identically prepared systems, is given by psi pi psi divided by psi psi. in measuring okay very good and uh, then we introduce we discussed a very simple system which is the harmonic oscillator system So there was a Hamiltonian, the another concept was a Hamiltonian, which was a self-adjoint operator, which was responsible for the time evolution. So the time evolution of the state was given by unitary evolution. And one particularly simple Hamiltonian that we considered and this is called the harmonic, the quantum oscillator, I called it. And the Hilbert space, in this case, was a Fox space representation, simply given by, it's like a highest weight or lowest weight representation built upon a Fock vacuum. And set of states, A dagger 1, etc a dagger to the power n square root of n factorial. So I'm now going to choose a psi which is normalized to 1 to give an orthonormal basis for this. And this is state 1, this is state n, and the set of vectors n furnish a, a, a basis furnish a basis for the Hilbert space. Okay. Now from here to make a transition to quantum field is actually relatively easy. And that's what we are going to do. And the main intuitive idea is that if you have like an electromagnetic field, a classical field, then its Fourier modes if you do the harmonic analysis then the Fourier modes behave like quantum oscillators, oscillators for a classical field and then by regarding those oscillators as quantum oscillators you basically get from it a quantum field and I will explain how that happens for a simple example.
Okay, let me erase this now because I, I want to write the dictionary here. So before getting into quantum field, let me try to explain what is a classical field. And classical fields. So space time, as we will see, is going to be a pseudo Riemannian manifold M1D. Let me explain that a little bit. So all physical processes take place in space and time. And if you have a d-dimensional space, then locally, like in this room, you can select coordinates xi, xm. Let's say m goes from 1 to d. The event, any event in space time, like I throw the chalk up. This event is specified by, or a light of light flickers, is specified by its location, so some space coordinate, and then some time coordinate. And for Newton, at Newton's time, time was absolute. What that means is that observers in relative motion record the same time. So my time and the time of the person who is in a train is the same. So if I have two observers using two different coordinate frames, then you will have X, XM prime, but the time will always be the same. If I have an observer O prime, an observer O, only the space coordinate was changing and the time was absolute. And the essential insight underlying Einstein's relativity is that time is relative. That's why the name relativity, which means that time also can change depending on the time recorded by the person in a train it doesn't have of time uh, of one particular event or the distance between two. If you have two events and they're separated by some time t1 and t2 here, here the their time would be t1 prime and t2 prime. And they can be complicated functions of these coordinates. So therefore, that uh, the fact that time is relative means that you should really not regard space and time separate, but space time as a together, as a single entity. And in fact, in uh, spatial relativity, space-time is just, so in general, it's, it's a single entity and it's going to be a Riemannian manifold, a manifold. So locally, and it's going to be a pseudo-Riemannian manifold. I will just remind you, you might have seen this already, some of you. So what that means is that in the simplest case, it's going to be a generalization of R1 plus D, which is a Euclidean flat space, will go over to R1 comma D. This is a Euclidean flat space. And this is called the Minkowski space time. And here the metric, there is a metric tensor you can write down. Here it will be just one, one, one diagonal for Euclidean space. Whereas here the metric is, so, so delta mu nu is the metric 
Here the metric has one minus sign. That's the only difference between special relativity and Euclidean space. Minkowski space-time and Euclidean space-time differ only by this very crucial minus sign. Which means that the line element here is just dx uh, mu square, dx mu, dx nu, delta mu nu, summed over mu nu. Whereas here it is eta mu nu, dx mu, dx nu. Then in particular, dt square, sorry, ds square is going to be minus dt square plus dx vectors. So x vector is just the space vector. This clear? Now a Euclidean Riemannian manifold you define as something which locally looks like flat space. You have a chart and then you locally it's flat, right? Locally you can have a chart, uh, a map onto. So basically you have a local chart, Minkowski pseudo Riemannian manifold is a manifold in the usual sense with a chart, but the metric is not Riemannian, it is not positive definite, but it has a signature minus one, one minus and D pluses. So pseudo Riemannian manifold simply means that the metric of signature minus plus Okay. Then given such a manifold, you can consider various things like a tangent bundle on it, let's say a tangent space at any given point is a tangent space T of m or T star of m. So given a manifold, you can consider various bundles. If you think of it as a, the structure group, I mean, if you think of this as a vector here, if you have a metric, pseudo Riemannian metric, just like, just, there's a complete analogy between the Euclidean manifold and the pseudo Riemannian manifold, Riemannian manifold and a pseudo Riemannian manifold, just that you replace a positive definite metric with a metric with a minus, one minus sign. There's a metric G mu nu. So this, uh, the structure group, uh, that's, it's called a structure group, right? It's acting here is instead of being SO D plus one is SO one comma D. And in fact, in physics, you require, a, uh, oftentimes you require a spin bundle, which is just a cover of this, which is a spin one comma D. Which is, in, again, once again, in complete analogy with SOD plus one and spin D plus one. So, I, I think everybody, all mathematicians are usually familiar with man, Riemannian manifolds. And on that, you can define tangent space and cotangent space and various bundles, right? You can take symmetric product. So a classical field in general is a section of some bundle. And depending on what bundle you choose, you call it a scalar field, or a spinner field, or a vector field, or a metric field. Okay, so that's the definition of a classical field. Is this clear? 
Let me take a simplest example, a scalar field. That's just a function, phi of x, phi of x. I will use x to denote all, the, all these coordinates. So x will really mean x mu. And when I put a vector on top of that, it really means xm. This is going from 0 to d. And this is going from 1 to d. In fact, you can have a more general bundles. You can have some other compact group. And you can consider, for example, the principal bundle. How do you spell principal? Of G. And the sections of this are, are the G, G, the sections of this bundle also you can consider. And these are called gauge fields of group G. Or you can consider associated bundles in some representation of this group. So you have basically a, your total group is spin 1 comma d cross g. And so locally, you have some chart in this manifold m. And the fiber is some representation of spin 1 comma d and a representation of this. So let's call this representation r and this representation R tilde. And if, for example, if you have an explicit vector space representation with some index A and here, here some index alpha, then a classical field is simply some object with two indices as a function of x, which is a section of this bundle. In fact, the simplest group to consider is G is equal to U1. And if you take a U1 bundle, and you define its connection A, then in some local patch, you can write it as A is equal to A mu dx mu. It's a one form. And physicists would call this A mu. It's clearly a vector, a con contravariant vector field, or a form. It's really a form. But they will call this is known as the electromagnetic potential. No, no, this is the connection of the U1 bundle. So in other words, you can define a covariant derivative delta is the connection, is the U1 connection. Sorry, it's the gauge field of the group. So the electromagnetic potential is basically a gauge field in this definition of U1. Yeah. 
this is local. It's in the local. No, so in many uh, situations how, where it was encountered, the bundle was trivial. So it was a bit, of, it's a bit pedantic to talk, call it a bundle. For example, if you just take the flat uh, Minkowski space, then it's, the bundle is trivial. But there are situations where the bundle is non-trivial. So, uh, Locally it's okay. Yeah, so therefore, it, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's a connection, it's a connection, sorry. I'm sorry, did I say it wrong? Sorry. Connection, I'm very sorry. Yeah, E is a connection. Whereas the other fields, this other, you can have an associated bundle, so you can have other, other fields can be sections of associated bundles. like a scalar field. Suppose you have a scalar field. Nabla is the connection. Connection, so how do, how do you want to say it? Okay, it's a. But you're trying to say that Yes. And the Yes. Yes, yes, I agree. So, yeah, let's say a connection one form corresponds to a gauge field. Does that satisfy you? So, for example, here we took a scalar field, but that scalar field could have been, if you had, a, for example, representation of some group with, uh, let's say, uh, SUN, a group like SUN, then phi could be in the fundamental representation, which could have some additional index. Same thing. I'm just saying that there, if you encounter this, don't get scared because there are physicists use different words. They call it a electromagnetic potential. Some people will call it a U1 gauge field. Or if it's U1. In general, it would be it could be an SU3 gauge field. Now surprisingly in physics, G is equal to SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. is all that you require to explain essentially all the physics that we have encountered thus far in the, up to the Large Hadron Collider. It's quite a remarkable fact. It, it's kind of, from a mathematical point of view, it's, uh, it's not clear what is so special about these groups. But from a physical point of view, they are special. And this is related to the strong nuclear force This is the electromagnetic force. So these together, in fact, the ICTP were unified by Salam and which is basically electromagnetism. Plus weak nuclear force.
No, 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 not at all. So in fact, that's, I'm coming to that point. These are classical fields, but they satisfy classical equations of motion. And this is how I'm going to make contact with our previous discussion where I considered Heisenberg, Hamiltonian equations of motion. The classical equations of motion are simply some partial differential equations satisfied by the classical fields. So the connection is not flat, but it must satisfy a classical partial differential equation. So it's not, a it's not any field, but physically relevant fields must satisfy these classical equations of motion. And there is a quantum version of that which we will come to. And that's what will make contact with our harmonic oscillators and this discussion, which so far is perhaps a bit abstract. So let's take the simplest example. If you have a U1 gauge connection, A, it's a connection one form. I can define from it its curvature two form. the curvature to form. It obviously satisfies a Bianca identity. And the equation of motion is d star of f is equal to 0. Okay, so these are some very simple generalizations of basically partial differential equation generalizing Laplace equation. For example, if you have a scalar field phi, it just satisfy d dagger d, I mean d star d plus d star d star, I mean okay, d dagger. And define a dagger operator, which is okay. But star is the uh, what is it called? Sorry, uh, hot hot star operator. Sorry. In particular, for a scalar field, this is nothing but the scalar Laplacian. So I can call it delta phi equal to 0. Delta phi is equal to scalar Laplacian. Delta is equal to scalar Laplacian. It's actually not a Laplacian because it would have been a Laplacian if it was Euclidean. With that one minus sign, it is called Dalembertian. But okay, you can think of it as a. Okay, so a scalar field, a classical scalar field in d dimensions, d plus 1 I mean dimensions, because 1 is time, satisfies delta Laplacian acting on phi is equal to 0. Or there can be more generalizations of this. For example, it can be delta phi is equal to m square minus m square phi is equal to 0. Notice that this is still, let me write it like that. My convention, maybe there is a plus here. Okay, 
maybe minus, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but notice that this, this is still a linear equation. Huh? <laughs> okay, the sign is important because that actually will determine whether that particle is tachyonic or uh, massive. So, so the sign is important. Uh, we can figure figure it out actually. So this operator is del square delta square is so is going to be e square minus p square uh, minus m square. So this is correct. This sign is correct in my convention. Okay. But more generally, you can also consider slightly more complicated nonlinear equations. Now, if I choose a coordinate frame, and this can be in many dimensions. It can be in four dimensions, one, three plus one dimensions. So the particularly interesting manifolds of our interest are going to be, of course, we live in four, four dimensions. So one comma three is a very special manifold. It's going to be what we will be talking about mostly. It can also be R1, 3, if you are in flat Minkowski, or it can be M1, 9, which is what is required in string theory, or you could consider M1, 1, for example, I will do it. You can consider any possibility, right? You can consider R1, 1. Or you can consider M1, 9, which is of a special form, R1, 3 cross some 6 manifold. And again, in string theory, this 6 manifold is often taken to be a Calabi or 3 fold, I mean, complex 3 fold. Okay, so with this description, so let me actually take a pause here. So last time we descri described quantum mechanics, you know, just single harmonic oscillator, Hamiltonian, Hilbert space, a state, etc., etc. We slowly want to make a transition to quantum field theory. We did the part quantum part last time. Now we want to go to the field part. And eventually, we want to go to general relativity. So let me erase this and make it a bit neater. So here we had observables. Uh, Self-adjoint operators. When we had space time, as we said, is a mit some manifold M1 comma D. And fields, they can be either connection forms or, or they can be curvature two forms. That is also a field because it's defined at every point or sections of various bundles. And now I want to ex explain what is a quantum field. And it's, okay, one way to say that it's kind of operator value distribution. Okay, to, to begin with, you can think of it as a function, but for some other niceties, you require it to be a distribution to make it more. So 
the notion of a classical field, you understand. I, I mean, I hope it's clear. So phi of x is a scalar valued function. The scalar valued map from M. That's the classical field. And we are going to make it an operator valued map. And I will this. Yeah, so there could be, yeah, in general, I'm just taking one example of a quantum field where it is a scalar valued map to begin with, classical field which is a scalar valued function to begin with. Uh, if you have a connection form, then you'll have a vector valued quantum field and so on. For the metric, it's, I mean, as, you, as we will, yeah, it's not a, okay, okay let's not go there. Because we actually don't really know how to associate a quantum field with a metric completely. So, any question? And the link between classical field and quantum fields for us is going to be through these equations of motion. And to do this, I'm just going to illustrate this first but in the simplest example. Namely, I will take a scalar field. And this is actually an important example because T and X in R1, one. Sorry, not R1, one, with a further identification. So the classical field satisfies a simple equation delta phi equal to zero. Wait, sorry, here. But the Laplacian in one plus one dimension is particularly simple because it's just minus del square in R plus del square del x square. And if I write t plus x is equal to x plus and t minus x is equal to x minus, then this, this becomes minus del plus del minus, two times maybe. This is exact analog of, if you had a Laplacian with a positive sign, Let's say del x square, del y square plus del square, del y square, del x square. This will be just del z, del z bar on a complex plane. If you had a complex plane and you had a Laplacian on a complex plane, you can just write that as del z, del z bar, right? And here it's del plus del minus. So we have an equation 
del plus del minus phi is equal to 0. Now remember last time we and I want to now get a quantum field. I want to now introduce a quantum field based on what we discussed last time. So last time we discussed consider harmonic oscillators or quantum oscillators with frequencies infinite number of them omega r is equal to just r. So, frequencies are basically 1, 2, 3, 4 like that. The Hamiltonian is just going to be omega r a r dagger a r summed over from r is equal to 1 to infinity plus a half. So, I have an infinite selection of operators AR and AR daggers. I can also consider an identical system with a tilde with the same property AR tilde dagger AR plus half. So I have another set of operators AR tilde AR tilde dagger. And now, recall that AR and AR dagger satisfy the Heisenberg equations. Um, just A and A dagger, if you remember last time in equations, that I dA by dt is equal to minus H A and so on. And more generally, I D of any operator A in this theory is defined by in particular, we last time we defined operators, we can write A is equal to some Q plus I P with some scaling that we had written. And Q and P also satisfied. So Q also satisfied this equation, and the Hamiltonian was Q square upon two plus sorry omega square Q square upon two plus P square upon two. So now I'm just going to construct the following operator phi of T x left moving, I'm going to call it, define, this is just a definition as AR e to the minus R t minus x plus AR dagger e to the plus I R. So, it's a real field. And I can define the right moving field. Okay, this I will explain the terminology in a moment, which is A tilde R e to the minus I R T plus X plus A tilde R dagger e to the plus I R T plus X. Okay, I hope I have not lost everybody this time. Okay, let me recapitulate. So, this system we understand very well, harmonic oscillators. I now just take a collection of harmonic oscillators. This is nothing that's as simple. 
they are completely I just the Hilbert space is the product of those Hilbert spaces. Hamiltonian is the sum of the individual Hamiltonian. And I just declare this to be my, well, this is clearly an operator valued field because it's a map from space to an operator. Right? That's what is meant by an operator valued function or distribution. And now I'm going to call phi of Tx is equal to phi of left Tx, T minus, sorry, this is really depends on T minus x and this depends on T plus x. Why do I do this? It will become clear to you in a moment. By construction, del minus del plus phi is equal to 0. Because you see, the quantum field satisfies the Laplace equation or the Larambertian equation. Moreover, you can define an operator pi, which is the derivative of phi, d phi by dt which is an exact analog of this P. Here if you found, if you look at the equations of motion of P, because the Hamiltonian is really just P square upon two, and the commutation relations of Q and P is I, this is the famous Heisenberg commutation relations. P was simply dQ by dt. And this is called sometimes the conjugate momentum. Then the Hamiltonian has a very nice property that we wrote down, R, AR dagger AR. The total Hamiltonian is this, right? The left Hamiltonian plus the right Hamiltonian. Is equal to an integral 0 to 2 pi over x So pi is also filled as a function of t and x. Can be written as d phi by dt whole square plus, I mean del phi by del t plus del phi by del x whole square. And in fact, this is pi, no? So this is pi square. If I replace pi, then it becomes pi dot square, d phi by dt. Oh, sorry, partial. Now, this might look uh, a, a bit uh, complicated, but it's not complicated. The point is the following. If I just take this definition of the field, take its derivative, and then do Fourier transformations, then what is going to happen is that the integral over x will basically make sure that AR and AR, the R of this and R, they are coupled together. They will enforce a delta function. And that's how you can go from here to there. So the, this is an exercise that take this expression, substitute this into this expression, do the x integral, and you will get this. 
Okay, it's a straightforward high school exercise. Now we come to the important point is that this Hamiltonian is a local density. This implies that the Hamiltonian is an integral of a local density over space. So let me give you some picture about this. You see, this, your manifold is this now. This is really R, it's really S1 cross R. This is your time coordinate. And your x coordinate is periodic. And you have a field defined on it, which is T as a function of x. If you did Fourier analysis along the x direction, what you will get are modes of the field oscillating around with different frequencies. And that explains why the frequencies come out to be integers, because they all have periodicity 2 pi, a fixed periodicity. So to begin with, a priori, when we just thought about harmonic oscillators, these frequencies had no reason to be integers. They could have been any frequencies. But here, in some unit, because this length could have been 2 pi L, for example, but the important point is that R is R upon L in that case. And they're integer spaced. We have taken L to be one, but we'll shortly consider the more general case. So the important point is that a classical field, when you so therefore, a quantum field, this is the slogan that I had told you, is simply a collection of harmonic oscillators, quantum oscillators. Okay, I think this time I perhaps lost more of the audience. Uh, so maybe I should stop and ask questions. I mean, wait for questions. This is a special case of a manifold, right? I'm going to consider more general manifolds later on. Yeah, the point is that the quantum field theory is well defined even on a curved manifold, but it's much more complicated to describe it. But it can be described. It's, it's done now. It's, it's, it's pretty well understood, the quantization of quantum fields in curved space-time. I mean, we will do that because that, that's what leads to Hawking radiation. So. Sorry? I wanted to avoid talking about Lagrangians because it becomes a whole lecture on in itself. And I wanted to take the shortest path to, another way to do it is using Lagrangian mechanics and actions and that's more naturally suited for path integrals, but which are usually harder to explain to a mathematics audience. Yeah, I reversed the order because I, it's again, because I think quantum field, I can define it in this manner. You're right that normally one starts with a classical field and does something called quantization. But the quantization is not really 
it's a, one can always take a classical limit, but going from the classical to quantum is a bit of a, it's a, it requires some physics, and I wanted to avoid that discussion. But that's a good question. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you want to include interactions, basically they are oscillators with unharmonic interactions. So you can also view them as oscillators interacting with each other. Yeah, but well, in that case, it's not even clear it's about representation. Yes, yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I'm not, uh, I will come to interactions uh, shortly because first I want to explain what is the meaning of a uh, particle and what is the meaning of a state and so on. And the, so. Yes, uh, exactly identical thing exists. It's, it's a lot more complicated to describe it, but quantization of gauge, yeah. All the, you can quantize all connections of, quantization of connection one forms has been done. That is known as quantum gauge theory. And it's, it, that procedure is much more complicated than I want to go, get into. It's not going to be required for our purposes, but it exists. Yeah, so. Modular space. Yeah, modular space of uh, connections satisfying those equations. Yeah, so modular space is a much smaller subspace of the space of all fields. Sure, but right? Here we are considering a much bigger space, which is the space of all fields. An equation of motion, but that's much larger than the modular space, generically. Yeah, in some cases the space can be simple, a flat, flat connection. Yeah, that's, yeah, but okay, you, okay, but that's actually a good point. Yeah, yeah. in many cases you can quantize that space, and uh, that's a simpler version of. So in mathematics literature, this appears like a space of flat connections. So those are sim special cases of this. Right. Okay, let me just recapitulate. The point is the following. A classical field satisfies some equation, like Laplacian of phi equal to zero. We constructed an object called the quantum field, which satisfies the same equation. Okay, so quantum field satisfies the same equation. Moreover, that equation can be viewed as a Hamiltonian equation of motion because if I write it's basically d phi by dt, you can check it's the same as minus h phi and i d pi by dt that I defined is minus h pi. And if I, using this equation, which will turn out to be exactly the same as phi dot, i times phi dot, so if I replace pi in favor of phi dot, I will recover this equation. So the equation of motion satisfied by a quantum field, this was the statement that I wanted to Sorry, so uh, with the replacement, pi is equal to phi, d phi by dt.
Uh, because there was an I here. Sorry, sorry, what am I saying? Sorry, with pi, sorry, sorry, sorry. Pi is equal to here. From here I will get I d phi by dt is equal to I pi. So, with one of the equations of motion will simply tell you pi is equal to d phi by dt. And if you replace pi everywhere, then you will recover this equation. So, see Heisenberg equation of motion are for two objects, phi and pi. But that's just a way of writing the second order differential equation in terms of first order differential equations. So by introducing pi is equal to d phi by dt, you can always write the second order differential equation in terms of first order differential equation. If you double the number of variables. That's basically how the phase space was introduced. If I just define pi is equal to d phi by dt, this equation can be written uh, as a first order differential equation. And that first order differential equation is the same as the Heisenberg equation of motion. And the final thing is that the Hamiltonian is local. Meaning it's defined by, depends only on derivatives. It doesn't depend. It's a local meaning that it's an integral of a local density. And that local density can be constructed using just derivatives, local quantities. So our Hamilton, if you look at it, it involves the derivative with respect to time and it involves derivative with respect to x at the same point. So that is the notion of locality. Now this is really very crucial, this is a very important concept because locality is very closely tied to causality. I mean in particular, I can erase this right, let's see, yeah I can erase this. The Hamiltonian does not include terms like this, phi x times some kernel. It could have had terms like that, right? This would be non-local because you will require the value of the field here and then the value of the field in Andromeda galaxy and then you will have to do something take an integral of them and this is not local, this is bi-local, you could call it bi-local if you want. But it's really not local. And this is really fundamental to lot of, it's really fundamental to quantum field theory. That the light the signal doesn't propagate uh, instantly. It, causality means that first of all the cause precedes uh, effect and signals do not propagate faster than the speed of light. You cannot communicate. Okay, let me contrast this with Newton's law of gravity, if you remember. Newton's law of gravity is that the force between the sun and the earth is the mass of the sun times the mass of the earth divided by the distance between them. This is not local in time. It's instantaneous in time. Because suppose the sun disappeared tomorrow, then you will suddenly have to put this force to zero immediately. But you know that the light takes eight minutes to come here. And this actually bothered Newton a lot. I mean, you think that Newton just wrote it down, but Newton, there is a letter by Newton saying that this sounds totally bizarre, this cannot be true. And this is really critical for general theory of relativity. And you know, probably heard about the gravitational wave detection recently. That has to do with the fact that something happened, the black holes, two black holes merged, 
But that signal took billions of years to come here, one billion year to come here, and we detected them today. But the event actually took place long time ago. This kind of thing cannot happen in quantum field theory. So Newtonian gravity is not allowed according to our principles of local field theory. And that's why Einstein had to construct his theory of gravity, which is local. Now I'm going to connect it to modular form so that you can appreciate some of these things a little bit better. So you remember we introduced a partition function Z of tau, or Q, I mean, sometimes I call it Q, sometimes I call it tau, let's say. Where Q can be e to the 2 pi i tau. And let's just take the left moving. You remember the Hamiltonian was the left moving Hamiltonian plus the right moving Hamiltonian. And so H left was just with R, A, R dagger, A, R half. I'm going to ignore the tildes, okay? There was a similar expression with the tildes. And this we evaluated. Now notice here there is an infinite constant let me call that the energy of the Fock vacuum, the ground state energy. So because now we have a collection of infinite number of oscillators, there is no guarantee that things will be finite. And here is a simple example. That even though this half is a finite, after you sum over infinite number of oscillators, you are, there is a potential for divergences. So let's keep this energy E naught. This is the energy of the, because that's the Hamiltonian, eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian for the Fock vacuum, which by definition is the energy of the Fock vacuum. So H acting on the Fock vacuum is equal to E0 times the Fock. But this sum we did last time, you remember? So this is going to be E to the E0, Q to the E0. That's, we don't know what to do with it. And this leads us, but we said, aha, sum over R, zeta function regularization. That I will regularize E zero S to be half sum over R to the minus S, where S is not equal to Sorry, this is not equal to one. Sorry, this is equal to not equal to minus one. And when S is finite, I can evaluate this. And then I will, so this is, looks like a bit of cheating, but let's do that anyways. And that will give us minus 1 upon 24. Because the, yeah, I agree, z of minus 1. 
Yeah, you have to do an analytic continuation and there is a pole, so it's not. <clears throat> so there is no pole at S is equal to minus one, sorry. <laughs> Now this looks a bit ad hoc, but the point is that this is one of the examples of what is known as renormalization theory in physics. In quantum field theory. So I want to take this as an example so that uh, of course the renormalization theory is a very vast subject and part of the Princeton notes were actually trying to really try to define it in some more complicated way. I mean, in the more detailed way, and it's, that is much more complicated than what I'm describing here. But it should, I wanted to give you a flavor of it so that you should understand what it means. And it's not something, I mean, after all, Euler also did this, so it's not something that only physicists do without any reason. And one of the, let's try to understand it a bit more physically, why, we did the zeta function regularization. So one can use a different regularization. And the problem is the following, that we have, our space is like that. Think of it as like a violin string. Of course, the violin string is, has a Dirichlet boundary condition. So the violin string has modes, Fourier modes, which are like that. And those are the different integer valued frequencies. Here we have periodic, boundary conditions. So again, we have integer valued uh, frequencies. But of course, we know that the violin string cannot oscillate. Once it hits the atomic size, there is uh, no sense in which the, you cannot really take the frequencies of the violin string to be extremely high. Very high octaves of the violin string don't really make sense. So that suggests that we should perhaps, sorry, did I bring my notes or not? I forgot my notes. I'll have to do this by memory, which is not a good idea. Okay, but I hope I don't make a mistake. So you can, uh, regularize it differently. So what this is doing is that it is really cutting off And this you can do very explicitly. And clearly, as epsilon goes to zero, because there is a pole here. As epsilon goes to zero, there is a, in fact, when you take a derivative, there will be a double pole. And this, again, I leave as an homoric exercise because I didn't bring my notes. But we can even do it here. Okay, can I leave this as a homoric exercise? You can take this function and expand it in powers of epsilon. What you will discover is that it has a pole minus 1 upon half epsilon square minus 1 upon 24 plus order epsilon. Notice that there is no term of order epsilon, one upon epsilon. Yeah, maybe plus. Some number times. Okay, if you say so. Okay. Now notice that our violin string was, had length 2 pi, but actually it could have had length 2 pi L.
and the atomic distance scale was say A. Then epsilon, which is a dimensionless parameter, is really A divided by L. Okay. A is another cutoff. So A is the distance, is the atomic distance. Sorry? No, so A is, if the violin string had length L, then I can define, I, I'm, I'm trying to explain the physical origin of this cutoff. Physical origin of this cutoff is that very high violin frequencies are getting cut off. And at what scale does that happen? It's at the scale where the atomic distance is important. So if the total string, violin string is of length L, you are introducing a cutoff epsilon, which you can take it to be purely mathematical cutoff, but you can imagine it also as coming from this following physical cutoff that the violin string actually has Beyond that point, it doesn't really make sense to think of the violin as a violin string as being a long string, but it's really composed of. Because it renders. No, it's a cutoff because basically uh, R, which is much bigger than 1 upon epsilon, does not contribute to this system, right? This is a smooth cutoff. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's a smooth smooth cutoff. Okay. Okay, it's it's called a cutoff. Okay, let's not uh, argue about. <laughs> okay, but it I mean it's a matter of terminology in physics literature. It, it is called a cutoff, and it's a smooth cutoff. So you can call it a smooth cutoff, and that will make you happy. <laughs> but it's a cutoff in the sense that higher frequencies of the violin string are cut off, meaning you, they, were, they are contributing less and less uh, exponentially uh, cut off from the direct. So it's, it's true that it's not a sharp cutoff, but they're exponentially damped, the contribution to this integral. Okay. And that typical, the, the frequency that you will see here, the most, I mean, the maximum frequency that you can hear is of the order of 1 upon epsilon, right? And our energy E0, in that case, if it had length L, would have been 1 upon L times half R, because the frequencies were 1 upon L, right? If I now, if you look at the term, which is, this goes as 1 upon L times epsilon, which is epsilon square, some constant times epsilon square minus 1 upon 24. So this goes as A square, if you plug it in here, this expression, A square times L, minus 1 upon 24 divided by L. Sorry? We divided by square, I'm sorry. And A is going to 0, I mean A upon L is going to 0, right? Now here you see the locality because you see this quantity can be viewed as an integral over So, the renormalization procedure No, 
No, no, I have not left. No, I will. For now, yeah. just give me two minutes to, I will come back to the world of mathematics. Just, just be patient. Okay, if I define epsilon is equal to A upon L, this is a completely mathematical statement, right? What, is, what are you not satisfied about? If, if I substitute epsilon is equal to A upon L, right, that follows? Okay. The point is that this is proportional to the length of the string. And I told you Hamiltonian is a local density. And renormalization is a says that Because we are dealing with infinite number of oscillators, right? And the procedure is twofold. One is called regularization. Which is a bit like what Euler did. You know, you can make it a zeta function regularization. So zeta function, you can use the epsilon regularization. Etc. Right? So the point is that you have, have infinite number of oscillators. And that's what is causing the divergence in this case. So you cut it off. You basically make sure that not all of them contribute to your problem. Or they, the ones that contribute, you put a smooth cutoff. You can also put a cutoff. I mean, the kind of sharp cutoff that you want can also be used. And that there is another way to do so. Yeah. So the, the, the second step is renormalization. And what does renormalization mean? Renormalization means that you're allowed to add local counter terms to the Hamiltonian. Actually, all this is much better stated in the Lagrangian formulation, but since I didn't use it, But maybe you should keep it in the back of your mind that it's, it's, the whole thing is much nicer to do it in the Lagrangian formulation. I'm just doing it in Hamiltonian formulation for the sake of economy because otherwise. So what does it mean? The point is the following, that if I'm considering the Hamiltonian of a violin string, how do I know that the energy is really what I wrote down? There could have been an overall constant that I could have added, right? Hamiltonian was some density a local density but surely a number like A square is also local density with an appropriate sign with a minus sign minus C over There was some C here, no? Half, okay. If the C is half, then it's half. The point is that that half is unimportant for physics because I can remove it by adding a local counter term. But I cannot remove this. You see, 1 upon L, I cannot remove by adding a local counter term. Okay, Sherry looks confused.
No, no. So the point is, so, uh, let me explain. What I, what I mean is that. Yes. Yes. The, no, the rules is that by allowed to add local counter traps to the local Hamiltonian. Yeah, let me finish the sentence, then it will become clear. To remove the divergences in the regularized uh, in the limit a going to zero. So you adjust the coefficient in precisely such a way that you can get rid of this divergence. It is local and it re Yes. No, the, 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 no. No. So what you, okay. So the point is that in this example, there is a local counter term allowed. Okay. This quantity is local. You agree with me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, for sure is the first term. That also actually, in this case, it turns out that uh, uh, your question is certainly valid. There is, in more generally, there will be more general local counter terms allowed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there are rules. Let me now try to. Um, uh, okay. So if you take a more general Hamiltonian, This Hamiltonian plus say, let's we add another term like lambda phi to the phi to the four. Then in this case, actually, In this case, actually, you are allowed to add more local counter terms, which can be proportional to this, and also the counter term that you were talking about, which is proportional to this. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so that, that's what I want to say, the, to keep the low energy physics fixed, but let's see how I want to state this. So uh, the new yes. Okay, in this, uh, for a free case. Yeah, so the, to remove the divergence in the limit, keeping low energy physics the same. Okay, so the point is that, okay, that, that's one way to say that you have some frequencies which were two, 1 upon 2 pi 1 and 2. We cut out some very high frequency modes which were very, very high, high, very high frequency which was the limit uh, in physical situations is taken in such a way that the physics at low energies does not change. Now you can ask, uh, does this not change the physics? But actually what you measure, what you are able to measure are only differences between, this is actually a particularly, 
bad example of uh, renormalization because this is the famous cosmological constant problem, which you cannot uh, measure without having gravity. But it's clear that what is physically important is just differences in energy because the overall uh, origin of where you put the energy actually has no meaning. So therefore, this counter term is allowed. If you do what you do, what you did, of course, you will get rid of the whole thing. So you want to keep the physics at low energies, the fixed. I would have said that, I would have said that, except that that's not correct. You don't want to add 1 over L either. Yeah, you don't want, because 1 over L is not local, right? L, if L is the length of the universe, you want to have a quantity which does not depend on, the, if I change the length of the universe, I, I, I should not change the local physics based on the length of the universe. So you don't want to add something, so that is the meaning of locality. That if, if I added something which depend on the length of the universe, then it's clearly not local because in this example, uh, yeah, perhaps what you said is the best way to say that is that, so, okay, let me make the correct statement. You can actually add terms dependent, dependent on phi square. So that's why I didn't want to say it the way you stated it. But let me state it, okay, more correctly. So in a quantum field theory, Generically, you will get divergences because you are dealing with harmonic oscillators of infinite harmonic oscillators. But you can always regularize it using the smooth regularization procedure. If you don't like a cutoff, smooth regulator. Let's use a better terminology that will not distract us from the main point. So by using a smooth regulator, you regularize the theory. And what that does is that essentially eliminates the, the infinite oscillator problem, it sort of essentially makes it a finite number of oscillators problem. And then you're allowed to add local counter terms in the Lagrangian, all terms in the Hamiltonian which are local. In the situation when the Hamiltonian has terms like lambda phi to the four, you are actually allowed to add terms which are proportional to this. In that case, you keep some uh, value of the lambda measured in experiment fixed and then you take the limit. Okay, so the statement that I would make is that renormalization means that to this regularized answers of the quantum field theory, we are allowed to add local counter terms to the Hamiltonian so as to remove the divergences in the limit uh, when the regulator is removed. So that any physical observable at low energy does not change. Yes. The point is that actually this, this thing we, which we are setting to zero, mm -hmm. it turns out that in, if you did the same calculation in four dimensions, mm -hmm. the measured value is actually not zero. So it can be, this is to be provided by low energy physics. Okay, so. Uh, Next time I'll try to think of a better way of saying this, okay? But the main point is that here you practically you saw that there was a divergence and I could simply drop that divergence by imagining that my Hamiltonian was different, right? That's the main point that is important for this discussion. And if I did that, then I would obtain Z of tau, which is exactly the dedicated eta function.
But you're absolutely right that a priori, this Q could have had some arbitrary finite constant. Could have been left over. And what is the principle which dictates this? One principle is that the physical observables at low energy should not change. In this particular problem, there is actually a symmetry which tells you which is conformal symmetry that at low energies you have conformal symmetry. Then if you demand that, then this implies that C is equal to 0. And let me make a short comment about the conformal symmetry because that's what brings us to conformal field theory. So the basic principle is that you want to put a regular regulator and you want to define the theory by regulating it and you want to, you're allowed to do renormalization, but you want to do renormalization following some principles, namely, the low energy physics should not change, or the symmetries that you think should be there in the low energy physics should not be violated. And in this particular case, if you look at the equation of motion del plus del minus phi is equal to zero, this is invariant under conformal transformation. Arbitrarily, I mean, okay, let, let's consider the real equation, uh, sorry, in the Euclidean space, del, del, z bar. If I take z going to f of z, and z bar going to arbitrary f of some other g of z bar, then this equation remains invariant. Let me call this omega, and this is equal to omega bar. So quantum field theories, which have, whose equations of motion have conformal symmetry or are invariant under conformal transformations, They are called conformal field theories. So it's a conformal quantum field theory. Sometimes it is just written as CFT. And in particular, in this case, Conformal symmetry means that if I just scale, the only scale in the problem is the length. So if I scale the size of the universe, the energy should, by just dimensional analysis, energy should scale as one over one upon length. Okay, so this, uh, uh, let's see. There are other examples of conformal field theories. For example, the theory that we wrote down, df is equal to zero, d star f equal to zero in four dimensions, d is equal to three, just for the Maxwell electrode u1, that u1 gauge field. It's also conformal invariant. What exactly do we mean by a conformal transformation? You can actually make it more, uh, another way to state a conformal symmetry is that, that the equations of motion are invariant under are invariant, in, if you had a curved manifold, then they are invariant 
under wild transformations. So for example, the Laplacian in two dimensions that we wrote down you know, which is like d star d plus d d star. You can actually, in, in some coordinate frame, you can write it as del by del x mu, square root of the determinant of the metric, g mu nu, del by del x nu. Okay, let's just take a Euclidean, or we have to put a minus sign here. Now, if I, do a while transformation, then the determinant of G will go as D times, 2D times the determinant of G. G is the determinant. This G is the determinant. So square root of G goes as e to the 2 psi square root of G. And g mu nu upper, the contravariant, goes as e to the minus 2 psi g mu nu. So we see that exactly only in two dimensions, the scalar Laplacian is is while invariant. Uh, Dx sorry, Dx sorry. And therefore, this quantity is, does not depend on Xi is invariant only when D is equal to 2, because then this term and this term will cancel. Right? So this is a way to state conformal, what is a conformal field theory? More generally, if you have a curved manifold or if you have more general forms and so on, what you mean is that the equations of motion should be while invariant. Sorry? No, you don't. Yeah, I'm changing the metric. Sorry? No, no, but uh, x psi is a function of x, sorry. So it's local. So it will not cancel. No, so this will go to Yes, but there is a derivative here, no? Okay, let me do it. If I just do this transformation on this Laplacian, what will I get? I will get this times e to the d minus 2 psi x del by del x nu. Sorry, g mu nu square root of g del by del x nu. So this will be the same as before, then you will pick up an extra term. You will pick up this derivative term. So this term will be 0 only when d is equal to 2. Ah, sorry, here, here, here. But 
but the equation of motion will not change. The point is that if d is equal to 2, there is minus 2. Ah, sorry, sorry, In, inside. No, no, what do you want? Yeah, this is correct, right? Minus 2, yes, sure, sure, sure. Yes, I agree. Minus 2. But therefore, the equation delta phi equal to 0 will be left invariant. So this while invariance of the equations of motion in a curved manifold are closely related, are, that's one way to think about the conformal field theories. Of course, there is actually much more uh, abstract definition in terms of purely of conformal field theory, purely in terms of conformal group, which we could have done. But uh, this is another way to introduce conformal field theory. So I think I will stop here. Let me now just very quickly summarize what we did. I think today's lecture was perhaps uh, less uh, transparent than last time. But it's because we are trying to do more things. What I said was that, okay, starting with quantum mechanics and harmonic oscillators, the quantum field, we could think of as just a collection of harmonic oscillators. And you could do pretty much everything. They satisfy the equations of motion. And we, I gave a one very simple example of renormalization. And what you want to take away from it is that by adding a local counter term, you could deal with the divergence, even though you were naively getting a divergent answer. If you imagine that your Hamiltonian was slightly different, it was possible to remove that divergence. So there was a. It is always possible to remove the divergence. Yeah, so the statement of renormalizability of quantum field theory is that under certain conditions, if the coupling constants are dimensionless, these are called renormalizable field theories, it is always possible to remove divergences. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a physics folklore theorem, a physics theorem, you can say. But to really prove it rigorously is this Clay million dollar prize for the QCD. So renormalization theory is the study So renormalization theory in general is the study of this limit epsilon going to zero. You have regulated uh, with some regulator epsilon and you want to remove that regulator. And you are allowed to add uh, up to local counter terms, uh, adding local counter terms. And the statement of renormalization is that under certain conditions, you can always remove those divergences. And all physical answers can be rendered finite. So whatever divergence you encounter, there are of course a lot more complicated divergences appear. But this particular example I think is simple enough to understand, you can really work it out. There is a divergence and you can remove it. And in this case, the physical principle that determines uh, that what constant, uh, I mean why we don't keep some finite constant still hanging around is because then we ensure that the theory becomes conformal. So your renormalization preserves a certain physical symmetry that you wanted to preserve. Okay, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>